I hope most of you have seen this now. It's what we call uh, the figure one in the Marmot Review, and it shows the uh, life expectancy, the little pale green dots along the top, and disability-free life expectancy, so a measure of health, um, the dark green dots, um, and that's related to uh, na level of neighbourhood deprivation. So the most deprived neighbourhoods on the left, the wealthiest on the right, and we can see very clearly the social class gradient in both life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Um, and you can see that gap between ill health and uh, life expectancy closing as you go up the social class gradient. Some other points from the Marmot Review. Health inequalities are not inevitable. We see them in every society to different levels. And there are plenty of things which can be done to flatten and raise those social class gradients in health outcomes. And I think um, the work that the King's Fund and others have been doing around classroom behaviours shows how some of these interventions um, need to really tackle um, the, both the causes of these um, unhealthy behaviours and the complexity of them. Um, focusing solely on the most disadvantaged will not be sufficient. We need proportionate universalism, that rather clumsy phrase. P uh, policies need to be both universal but proportionate to need. Targeting will not raise and flatten the gradient to the scale that's required in order to tackle health inequalities. And fourthly, reducing health inequalities is vital to the economy. Um, it's very expensive, health inequalities. This is really just to make the point that we have very large-scale um, inequalities within local authority areas. Um, Westminster has one of the highest uh, life expectancies, female life expectancies in the world, actually, um, but also uh, some of the highest inequalities in England. So we really need to dig below average figures um, and look at what's actually happening within small areas, because there are some very, very stark inequalities there. Um, this is just a sort of graphic representation of proportionate universalism. What we are trying to achieve through policies to tackle inequalities is the lifting and flattening of that gradient. And what we've actually been seeing is that that gradient has been um, lifting, but not flattening. In fact, in some cases, it's been widening. Health inequalities are probably getting worse, and we would anticipate um, worsening still as uh, some of the welfare policies and economic context begins to really bite and show its outcomes in health. The life course approach, very important in the Marmot Review and in our subsequent work, um, there are appropriate policies at different stages of life, and we know that health inequalities and other inequalities um, begin very, very early in life and then accumulate throughout life. So we see trajectories of inequality deepening as you go across life and culminating in shorter life expectancy. There are appropriate interventions to tackle um, behaviours and uh, the social determinants of health for each uh, stage of life, really. Uh, this was a calculation we did um, for the Marmot Review about the costs of inequalities. I think the final figure we came up with was that health inequalities cost the economy 70 billion a year and um, the cost to the NHS something in the region of 5 billion and I think that was a very conservative figure actually. Um, of course the more important argument is the number of lives lost. And in the Marmot Review we had six um, policy objectives all around the most important um, social determinants of health and stages of life. The first, and we thought the most important, was around um, the early years, and I'll come on to that very briefly in a minute. The second was around education. The third, fair employment and good work for all. The fourth was a healthy standard of living, that's around <coughs> incomes and assets. Uh, the fifth was around places and environments, and the sixth um, around public health. And underpinning all these, is the notion that we are trying to create the conditions for people to be able to take control over their own lives. Education, of course, um, I'm sure many of you are very aware of this, um, relates to uh, levels of health. Um, people with no qualifications on the right of this graph um, uh, have a greater relative uh, illness than people who've been educated at university and so the social class education gradient here. This really begins very early in life. Um, we had this graph also in the Marmot Review and it shows how a uh, very young, uh, just under two uh, here, there's a measure of cognitive uh, functioning and development which shows that the brightest kids at the very top um, and the ones with lower cognitive function at the, at the bottom, um, the dark green lines are the wealthiest kids, the pale green lines are the poorest kids and you can see what happens by the age of 10. Even the brightest, poorest kids are performing well below the uh, levels of the less bright, richest kids. You really begin to see these uh, social class inequalities emerging fairly early. 
uh, whiz through these, but these are uh, demonstrating the uh, beginnings of inequalities in early years, and they're very easy areas, or relatively easy areas to intervene in. They're about parenting, they're about encouraging children to read, um, and uh, they're about improving the parents' lives in terms of housing, knowledge and skills, uh, finances, and that has big impacts on children. And um, we've done some analysis, I'll just whiz through this, it is all available, and I'll make these slides available. Um, about the impact of uh, the economic uh, recession and welfare changes, um, both detrimental um, and likely to widen health inequalities further. This is a, a depiction of that uh, in relation to housing, uh, what's affordable in London um, and unaffordable in London with housing benefit. The dark green areas are unaffordable. Um, in 2011, there are some uh, large areas of London which are unaffordable, but that increases dramatically. We're now halfway through this period and we're seeing a dramatic increase in homelessness and people being moved out of London um, and so on as a result of all of this. There are opportunities across the new system um, to implement some of the um, policies which we've talked about and the evidence shows can make real impact. Um, some of this will be um, evident from what I've said earlier around social determinants, proportionate universalism, making the cost case, and that's obviously hugely important, um, and linking agendas across local authorities. Um, one of the advantages, of course, of having public health in local authorities is that you're able to make the connections into um, the social determinants in terms of transport, housing, education, early years, and there really are some great opportunities there. Um, and health and wellbeing boards we've seen across England are really beginning to take action. And there is a fairly strong duty on clinical commissioning groups to tackle health inequalities and we look forward to seeing how um, that, is, that um, manifests itself. Um, I'll just end with a comment about the ambition and realism that's needed at the moment. Um, we need ambition. There is um, plenty of activity that can be done. It's often difficult to do. It's large scale. It can be expensive. Um, however, in the context uh, that we're in at the moment, and when we talk to local authorities and other areas who are really taking uh, on work around health inequalities, we say if your uh, figures aren't worsening steeply, you are doing a very, very good job. Staying still at the moment is actually a huge achievement.